We just have this goodly number out this Lord's Day morning. We appreciate so much if you're visiting with us. We consider you an honored guest. I encourage you to take your Bible and study along. I have no intention of belittling anything you might believe, but I have the responsibility of teaching what I find to be truth. If I teach something wrong, I stand to be corrected. In a few moments, we'll stand and sing the song of invitation. All things, well, if our baptistry is not filled right now, but we'll find a baptistry if you need to be baptized this morning or if you need to be restored. Our prayer is that you would do so this very morning. If you have your Bible, if you'll turn with me to the book of Ephesians and the 6th chapter, I want to read one verse for the thought of our study, and that's verse 12. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. When the Apostle Paul penned this letter to the Ephesian church, he makes mention of a spiritual realm identified as heavenly places. One can take their Bible and look in the Ephesian letter and the first chapter, and they'll find in verse 3 that he talks about all spiritual blessings are found in Christ Jesus. Then he comes down to chapter 2, and he talks about in Christ Jesus, he talks about us being raised to sit with Christ in heavenly places in verse 6. So I may not know a lot about these heavenly places. I know Paul mentions it five times. But I recognize that spiritually I sit with Christ. Now I live in the flesh and I am in the physical realm, but spiritually I am with the Lord. And those who've died in Christ and who've left the physical realm, they still sit in God's spiritual kingdom. So heavenly places is mentioned several times. But when you come to the 6th chapter, Paul talks about a battle that occurs in the spiritual realm. And I've often thought about these battles that we fight. When the Apostle Paul wrote to the church at Ephesus, he lets them know that we wrestle against powers in heavenly places. He said we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts. So I want to take just a few moments of our time and think about that we fight these battles in a spiritual realm. I may not know much about that realm, but one thing I do know is that there are a lot of things that occur in that realm, and one thing I need to know is that while I fight my battle here, I'm fighting against these host of principalities. The first thing I would like for us to do is to think about the devil. And what I want us to do is look at how the devil in this realm, in this unseen realm, makes accusation against man and against God. If you have your Bible, turn back to the book of Job and the first chapter. And when you come to the book of Job and the first chapter, you'll find that Job was called a blameless and upright man, one who feared God and shunned evil in verse 1. He is a man who sacrifices to God daily. He is one who is, that esteems God and gives God glory. But when you come down to verse 6, notice that the Bible says there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan also came among them. Now in this realm, notice that God calls the angelic host or these spiritual beings, those identified as the sons of God to present themselves. And notice the devil comes. And notice God knows where Satan is, but he makes him give an account of himself. He said, Satan, from where do you come? And Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro on the earth and from walking back and forth on it. Then notice verse 8. Job, or God asked Satan, have you considered my servant Job? Have you ever thought about what a compliment that was? That in this spiritual realm, God looks down to earth and he sees his servant Job and he says, now Satan, I know you've been walking back and forth on the earth, but have you seen the righteousness of my servant Job? He said, there's none like him on earth. He's a blameless man. He's an upright man. He fears God. He shuns evil. But notice Job is not, that Satan's not impressed with Job. He says, does Job fear God for nothing? And he makes an accusation in verse 10. He said, you put a hedge around him. Now, God, I tell you what you do. You take that hedge away from Job and he will curse you. He will cannot continue to worship you. Look at verse 11. 
He says, stretch out your hand and touch all that he has. He will surely curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your power. Only do not lay a hand on this person. So what does Job do? Job is here fearful of God, serving God, worshiping God. And then Satan makes this accusation to God, saying the only reason Job is doing this is because of everything you've blessed him with. If you take away his blessings, he'll curse you, God. And notice beginning in verse 13 that Satan, because he's been given permission now, he's only allowed to do what God said. God said, you can take all that he has, you just can't touch his person. What does he do? He starts taking his livelihood. He starts taking his livestock. And he comes down and even kills his children. Have you ever thought that now before he could do anything, the devil had to get permission? And then God allowed this to happen and notice that Job knows nothing of what's going on. He doesn't know about this conversation between God and Satan. All he knows is that one day he loses everything. And it's like calamity upon calamity as one servant is coming to say, you've lost your camels. Another's coming and says, you've lost the, this. Another comes and says, your children are dead. And as you just receive bad news after bad news, and notice he said at this time that here is a man who when he sees all that is lost, what does he do? He falls down. Look in verse 20. He tears his robe, shaves his head, falls to the ground, and worships. I want to raise a question to you this morning. If you would face calamity after calamity after calamity, your children are all dead, all that you have is gone, the pain in your heart is fresh. How many would worship? And that's the first response of Job. Job said, naked I came from my mother's womb. Naked I shall return there. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Now when you come to chapter 2, notice again there's a day and the sons of God come to present themselves before the Lord. Here they are again. And notice Satan comes along with them. And notice again, he says he's walking back on the face of the earth. And notice the Lord said to Satan, Now have you considered my servant Job? There's still none like him on earth. He's blameless and upright man. He fears God. And he still holds fast to his integrity, although you incited me against him to destroy him without cause. Now what does Satan say? Yeah, but you wouldn't let me touch him. Oh, you let me take his possessions and you let me kill his children. But I'll tell you what, you let me touch his flesh. And I'll tell you what, he will curse you. And notice what the Lord said, Behold, all is in your hand. You just can't take his life in verse 6. Anything you want to do, you just can't kill him. And notice that here he is struck with painful balls from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head and he has to take this pot shirt and he scrapes himself in the midst of the ashes and his wife says, why are you holding on to your integrity? Curse God and die. And if you thought about all this time, here is going on behind the scenes, this picture. We get a peek behind the curtain. Job doesn't know any of this. Job doesn't know that, that Satan has made these accusations to God and that God has allowed these things to happen. He remains faithful. And Satan would not concede feet. He, he argues and accuses and says, if he touches flesh, he'll curse you. And God said, he's in your hands. You can't take his life. And notice he is cursed from head to toe with boils. But look, if you will, in the book of Job in the 23rd chapter. Notice Job does no wrong the first time, and Job really doesn't do wrong here, but here's where Job, he begins to proclaim God's righteous judgments, but he has some questions. Notice he says in verse 2, Even today my complaint is bitter. My hand is listless because of my groanings. Oh, that I knew where I might find God, that I might come to his seat. I would present my case before him and fill my mouth with arguments. I would know the words which he would answer me and understand what he would say to me. Would he contend with me in his great power? No, but he would take note of me. There the upright could reason with him, and I would be delivered forever from my judge. 
Now, God's already taken note of him. He's already talked to Satan twice. But Job is feeling alone. Job is saying, now if I could present my case before God, I would question God and say, why has this happened? And God would answer me. And he said, God would give an account and I would understand it. But you know that's not what happened. When you come to the book of Job in the 40th, 38th chapter, you remember God comes to Job and God asks questions that Job cannot answer. He said, who is this who darkens counsel, in verse 2, by words without knowledge? Now prepare yourself like a man. I will question you. You will answer me. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determines its measurements? Surely you know. And then he begins to ask all these questions about the universe, about the stars, about the wildlife, about the mountain goat, about the wild donkey, about the wild ox. And he said, tell me all about it, Job, if you know it. And then if you come to Job chapter 40, notice that Job says in verse 3, I don't know the answers. Behold, I'm vile in verse 4. What shall I answer you? I lay my hand over my mouth. Once I've spoken, but I will not answer. Twice I'll not proceed. Well, God goes ahead and challenges him some more. And he talks about the Leviathan and the behemoth. And he comes down and you'll find Job doesn't know the answers. So in Job 42, look at what Job says beginning in verse 2. I know you can do everything, and no purpose of yours can be held from you. You ask, who is this who hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore, I have uttered what I did not understand. Now, what did he say back in 23? He said, if God would give me the answers, I would understand them. Now he says, okay, okay, God, I don't understand. These are things too wonderful for me which I did not know. You said, I will question you and you shall answer me. He said, I've heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes see you. I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. And notice here is a man who comes to God and he repents because he doesn't know. But you know something? As far as the divine record is concerned, Job never knows why God allowed him to suffer. But have you ever thought about what God had writing on Job? He said, Satan, have you thought of my servant? And Satan says, I can make him sin. And God allowed him to be put to the test. Have you ever thought what he had writing on his faith and his integrity and his love? Had he cursed God, the devil would have rejoiced. But have you ever noticed he held on to his faith even when he didn't understand everything? That sometimes is the most difficult time in life is when we don't understand everything. But now then, if you take your Bible, turn to the book of Luke in the 22nd chapter. And when you come to the book of Luke in the 22nd chapter, on the night that Jesus will be betrayed, he tells Simon something in verse 31. He says, Simon, Simon, indeed, Satan has asked for you. Now notice, Satan can't do anything without God's permission. He had to get permission. He's asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. But I've prayed for you that your faith should not fail, and when you have, when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. Again, we see Satan after a follower of God. He goes before God to seek permission for a certain amount of power. And now Peter doesn't believe he'll be, give in, even though he's warned. Now, Peter has a little more information than Job had. He knows at least Satan has asked for permission for him. But we don't know all that. He just knows that he'd asked to sift him as wheat. And Peter did not believe he would fall into the hands of the wicked one. But you ever thought about Peter fell? Peter was sifted. And he never understood completely why probably, but he knew this much that he was one who gave in. Job did not fully give in, though Job did repent because of his questioning. He never did give in and, and curse God. But here's Peter who did fall and deny the Lord. But now let's look at a third picture. Have you ever thought about Jesus in the book of Matthew in the fourth chapter or Luke in the fourth chapter when he goes into the wilderness and the devil tempts him? And notice the Bible says the Spirit of God led him to the wilderness. God allowed him to be tempted. But he doesn't give in. I've had some people say, you know, preacher, he really wasn't tempted. Well, pray tell me why the word tempted is used. 
And how could the Hebrew writer say in Hebrews 4, he was tempted in all points and yet without sin? He was tempted. There was a temptation placed before him where he could have sinned. He had a choice. He chose not to sin. There was a point there where he could have thought right from wrong and he chose not to do wrong. The temptation was present. I want to take that. I want to make several points of application in the lesson years. As Brother Dean read from James 1, we need to remember several things. Number one, God does not tempt us. The devil does. In James 1, 13, it says, Don't say, if I'm tempted, I'm tempted of God, because God's not tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. God is seeking to save the soul, not destroy it. But the second thing we need to remember is trials and temptations can be for our good. That's what we read a moment ago in the book of James. Go back and look at what he says in James 1. He said in verse 2, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. I've got to be honest with you. I don't always rejoice like I should on that. When the trials of life come and the testing of life comes, many times I'm frustrated, many times I'm discouraged, many times I don't see the benefit. But he says if you let, you let patience have its perfect work, you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. And if you lack wisdom, pray for it. He says ask of God, but pray in faith. Learn that life is brief. Learn to ask for God's wisdom. Learn to apply it correctly. Learn that you will be put to the test, but you're learning patience and trust in God. Thirdly, the devil can only do what God permits. You ever thought God can stay the hand of the evil one at any time? God's in control. Never think that Satan is as equally powerful as God. He is a created being. Now, he had free will. He sinned. He violated the law of God. He's gone contrary to God. He's more powerful than man. But I want to tell you, he's not as powerful as God. And one day, he's going to be cast into eternal fire. I think sometimes we almost have in our mind that the devil is the equivalent of God. He is not. He is a created being. But that brings up something else I want us to think about. Have you ever thought about many times we suffer, but we don't know what's going on behind the scenes? Lately, I've been struggling a lot with my anxiety and OCD that has just been giving me fits in my life. And many people have anxiety or depression. Many people have physical elements. Other people have problems. And it just sometimes in life you just feel overwhelmed. And you go by how you feel. And sometimes when it's a mental problem, you, you, your feelings are telling you something, even though you know the Word of God is saying something else. And many times I've had to try to learn, and many times my loved ones have to say, trust what the Bible says instead of how you feel, because if you go on how you feel, you feel alone and abandoned and lost and can, you're self-condemning. But have you ever thought about these things that we're going through? Whatever trial in life you face, whatever heartache you're going through, whatever problem you have, we may not know why we're going through it, but we know this much about that problem and that issue, that there is not a time that God is not with us. And what we need to do is, like Job, maintain our integrity. Because sometimes it's easy to just want to throw up your hands and quit and say, I don't feel like I'm doing right. But I want to tell you, you keep your faith in what God has said and not in how you feel. Job probably felt abandoned. But Job said, I'm going to keep my trust in God. But I want to tell you what else we need to remember. When we're facing spiritual battles, we don't know what God has riding on us. Could God in heaven be looking down at you and saying, have you considered my servant Doug or David or James or whoever? You put your name there. 
And God looks down and says, they maintain their blamelessness. They're walking in uprightness. They're continuing to walk in the faith. And you know, my friend, there's nothing that would anger the devil more than to see someone not give in to his wiles and his temptations, but maintain their faith in God no matter what. That's why it's so impressive when Job said in Job 13, 15, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Who else will I trust? Who else can I go to? I've lost everything else on this earth. There is only one I can turn to. That is the Almighty God. And Job said, and if he takes my life, I will die trusting him. We fight battles in a spiritual realm against principalities and powers in the heavenly places. Wickedness. And we don't always know what's going on. But God could have a lot riding on the Kemper Heights congregation. Say, look at my disciples. You know how you know them? They love one another. They love me most importantly. They put me first in their life. They're following me. And when the trials and temptations and troubles of life come, they don't turn from me. They turn to me. I want to tell you that's become so important to me in life. Don't turn from God. Turn to God when life tumbles in. This morning, if you need to make your life right, our prayer is that you see that God is good and God is right. And one day you can be with God if you'll obey Him. As together we stand and sing, we cordially invite.